first of all, I, I don't know whether to talk to the very glamorous photograph of you in the middle of the screen or talk to you in the yes. front at the side. <laughs> but uh, uh, first of all, I think it's fantastic that you agreed to do this and also that you agreed to do the first one because, you know, it is, it, it is a, a venture into the unknown for both of us, for all of us in this, in this um, sense. Yeah. And I wanted to start with saying how much I enjoyed going on to your website, your gallery website, because um, I think it's very courageous of you to you're doing your weekly sort of reports but you're also personalizing it by making it uh, come from your home and i think this is one of the really interesting things about this particular time is mm -hmm. digitally we've entered each other's homes in a way that we've never been able to do before mm -hmm. and um, sometimes that view is curated and sometimes it's not so I think both you and I today have tried to curate our views in order. It's a tough crowd, Mary. <laughs> Very glamorous. I love the hydrangea flowers. But then what I, I, so what I really wanted to start with, first of all, is tell us a little about what lay behind your decision to open your own gallery. Because I think in a sense it's relevant to what we're talking about today. Mm. Um. It kind of, it sort of grew like Topsy, my gallery. It's weird. I, I was living in London for a long time and I was on the edge of the art world um, and I wanted to be in it somehow. I know it's, it's a really hard world to, to enter. There's a, there's a, you know, a glass wall up. And so when I came back from living in London, I was very lucky to have met Kathleen Fogarty at FHE Galleries and she sort of opened a lot of the doors for me um but then i was out on my own but i i knew that i wanted to do something in the art world having done a finished an art history degree in um in london and i was coming home to this new i'd been away 20 years and new zealand had changed while i was away it was you know te reo was an official language i'd grown up you know 20 years that's half my life away and I was coming home to this place where being Māori suddenly was a thing, you know, and growing up as a, as a primary school, I was the only kid in my school and it was sort of, you know, there was slight shame associated with it and all of that difficult racist stuff that had been going on a long time suddenly had been foregrounded and now here I was when it was called to be brown. And so I, and the gallery's kind of got a, has gone down that direction without any without any kind of particular focus from it sort of become that right. and i feel like i'm following my following my instincts and following my heart in the sort of artists that i show I right and that, and that yeah that does and it sort of feeds into what we're going to discuss today which i you know we've got on the screen the role that indigenous artists have in alerting or awakening our understanding uh of their um their, what they do and we're at their, their links to the land, our responsibilities to the land. And of course it is all our, all our responsibilities, isn't it? It's mm. not just artists, but there's something about what artists do that make us think about these situations, these uh, responsibilities in a completely different kind of way. Mm. And uh, it took us a while, didn't it, to choose which two artists we were going to focus on because you can't yeah. talk about too much in uh, just a short period of time, but both these artists, it seems to me, Nico Hinden, who I'm, I'm more familiar with because you know you can see her work in in, in exhibitions in New Zealand, That's but the, also uh, Nungina uh, Marawili. She there's a there's a can you mute your <laughs> If everybody could mute that mute their 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 cameras apart from Tim and I just till we get to the discussion part, then you can pass the wine around. Um, you know that 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 these two artists come from backgrounds that have similarities, but also backgrounds that have enormous differences. And I wondered if you wanted to talk a bit about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, for one thing, they're at opposite ends of their their careers and their lives. Nico's just starting out, she's not yet 30. Um, but, and 
Noina, at the other end of her career, she's in her early 80s. Mm. And she's been working for a long time. But they, they both, I mean, even the, I mean, obviously the material they use is organic and from the land. Mm. You know, Nico uses um, paper mulberry, Ote, and Noina uses bark from stringy bark trees. I mean, there are, there are links and comparisons and differences with them, but they're both connected to um, maybe environmental cycles as well. Right. I'm going to harvest trees at a certain time. Uh, Nico the same. She harvests the mulberry at full moon. They're, they're, they're very connected to natural cycles rather mm. than you know, to the Gregorian calendar, for instance. But there's also a deep learning and an understanding of the importance of nature, but also the sort of, it, it's almost like knowing the science behind it without knowing the science behind it, if you like. I mean, I was fascinated with the way Nico has, you know, she goes back to Hawaii to learn the art of uh, making aute because of course there aren't any mulberry trees left in New Zealand any longer. So the primary part of her art making comes now from somewhere else. But mm. it, they, Māori did bring Aote to New Zealand, didn't they? Mm. Yeah, no, no, they do exist here. We do did still they? have that tree, the paper mulberry, but it's, the climate is harsher here, and so it doesn't grow as well. But certain parts of the North Island, it does grow, and she okay. harvests it here. Okay. She grows and harvests so it here why, as well. So why did early Māori stop? producing Aote? I think because it, it didn't grow as well as it should have, okay. as well as they were used to. When they when it came on the migratory canoes, you know, it had come from much warmer climates. Yeah. It didn't adapt so well here. Right. But also um, Aote in the Pacific was used as a garment to keep warm. And mm. here in New Zealand, um, an Aote garment isn't going to do you much good. They, mm. what they want that what they used here in the end was were kōrowai and feathers yes. and harakeke so yes. it was a harsher climate so ote was a practice that died out yes yeah and but it's it's she went back to hawaii to learn the traditions mm. of making it didn't she mm. and and it's fascinating because right the way across the pacific now there is a revival of these traditional techniques but they're different in mm. every place. I mean, um, Jean Clarkson is part of a cooperative. They, they make uh, the equivalent as a group. Uh, and uh, whereas Nico has really studied it herself and now is in the, as a young woman still, is passing on that yeah. tradition. Yes, exactly. But the, the tradition of, of beating Ote, which she learned in Hawaii from, from teachers there, it is a group practice you you the women mainly women would do it together um but so but she's come down here um and as you say is doing it on her own um but she is part of a, a whakapapa of other yeah. um, mainly female artists in the pacific you look at cora allen wickliffe who is also reviving the new way in Hiapu, mm. that John Poulet has sort of brought to our attention as well. So there's there's something in the air. It's very yeah. interesting. There's yeah. the, the, these old practices are being revived um, and tradition is being um, respected, but there's innovation now. You look at the markings on yeah. the work. So could you bring up the second slide with images of the work? Just so that people can see what we're talking about. Uh, but there's a wonderful... Uh, video that I watched if we just talk for a, min a minute about Nungi now because I was looking at some of the places where she's worked and I came ac across the um, uh, yeah if we can have the next one that'd be great so uh, I came across a, a video of her working and she's sitting both of them sit cross-legged how I would love to have that kind of flexibility in my knees now <laughs> long gone I'm afraid but these are the, what's is so interesting about uh, he, these are um, Nico's work is these are responding to very specific moments in time, aren't they? Mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas Nuinas are, are dealing with 
the land in a different kind of way. So let's talk about these two first. And I mean, would you like to talk us through their, yeah. we can talk about process and then we can talk about uh, what they actually signify. Mm. Well, these, these works, as you can see, they look like paper and they feel like paper. They're very, very fine. Um, and you compare um, Nico's Ote Tapa works with Pacific Tapa, which is often a lot thicker. These mm. are very, very finely beaten and perfectly made. Um, and you can see why they wouldn't really keep you warm uh, if you wrapped yourself in it. Um, but she has, the process is incredibly time consuming. Um, I won't go into the detail because I'll probably get some of it wrong, but um, it's weeks and weeks of preparing the fabric, um, mm. drying it out, um, melding it together so that there are no holes. That it's and it's the there. beating, it's actually these beaters that yes. you beat the cloth together in a yeah. sense. And because it's a sap, it, it works like a glue in the end, doesn't it? That's right. And they, the, the different sheets combine. And they, many of you will have been at the, um, the art fair last year and you would have seen Nico working um, and her stand, her little area of the floor, and she was working on the floor, was just beside my stand. Um, and that was the second time I'd met her. But it is, she uses a Putakawa beater um, and a hardwood kind of an anvil. Um, and it's incredibly time consuming and hard work. She yeah. carried that anvil back from Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> How she got it home, I don't know. Oh, but I even know. making the beaters is a, a very skillful job because I, I watched a little video of her describing how you know you get the shape made and it you know, does that was a, a handle and just a long wedge but then you have to groove it and she used a shark's tooth and yeah. it took her a week and she said at the end of the week her fingers were completely numb and it took her days yeah. whereas other um other artists now are, are sort of cutting shortcuts and you know my husband David made one for uh, Jean Clarkson and because they didn't have she, they, she needed one in a hurry he actually made this I don't know if you can see it but it's just it's a two bits of wood with nails glued through it and you can see the grooves underneath and you put your piece of wood in a box and drag it across and gradually gradually you uh, make the grooves but each side of the beater has a different width of groove in order yes. that you know so you you know you 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 refine it as you go along so exactly. I mean, this is a really physical job Mary, can you just show us those pieces that you just did again because we didn't see them with this while i was sharing the screen can you just hold uh, that up for us again can you see it there a little so bit so it literally is a piece of wood and oh, this is this is because David was asked to make this and the nails are glued on the side and he has a, a box and the beater goes inside and then you have to physically drag the nails across the piece of wood and that cuts, so that cuts the grooves. But what Nico did was she did it with shark's tooth, mm. which, so you do, literally are doing one line at a time rather than a whole series of grids. Well, but even OCD when it comes to that, she was totally demented about it being, sorry, demented, that's a loaded word, but she was very focused obsessed? on it. Being, obsessed? Right, obsessed. Demented? No. Obsessed, yes. Um, about it using the materials that would have yes. been used to yeah. make the beta so that yes. the marks and the <clears throat> would be as they would have been. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, it really shows. And then if you watch the video, you can see her. It's like, I keep thinking it was a bit like making bread or pasta. Because she, she has this great wad of ote and she folded it. And then you beat and you beat and you beat. And then it stretches out and you fold it and you beat it again. I mean, it, it yeah. took, you know, sort of like a week of beating to make yeah. a sheet. And that's even before you start to think conceptually about what you're going to do yeah, with and interesting talking to her as well you would think that that would be the bit that you just want to get over with like let's get this damn beating over with let's make the thing and then let's start the art but she loves the physical side yeah. of it that's one yeah. of that's she loves it just as much as making the designs on on the ote itself so and, um, and mm. tell us about the, what the, the triangles and the lines symbolize oh yeah so can you uh, Penny, can you bring up the image again? Um, she, um, 
she's painting very often um, the star charts and the movement of stars across the heavens and the the large work on the left at the horizontal line is the eastern horizon so you're looking towards the east and all of those lines coming up are the stars as they rise in um, the 36 star houses or um, whare fetu as, as they're known in, in Māori. Each of those 36 houses has a name and if you look across there are actually 36 lines. Each within those houses uh, different stars rise at different times and so the large, I don't know if you can really see on your screen but there's a large black, larger black line part way up on the left that represents the rising of the 13 stars of Matariki. Then if you move further along there's a smaller black area and that's the three stars in Orion's belt. So each of these lines represents the rising of a star across the heavens and on the right is a grid of time. Mm. So she's done an hourly grid. <clears throat> so this is a, nav a reference to a real source of navigation, understanding the star. I mean, this is how yeah. uh, Pacifica people travelled yes. using, you know, a, 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 a knowledge of stars exactly the same. Exactly. And, and she, she was on Hokulea. She did one of those Pacific voyages and one of her jobs was to <clears throat> navigation. So she really understands what the stars are for and how important they are. Mm. And yeah. what... Oh, what I love about them is they both work as abstract artworks and yet they have so many layers underneath them. They're so rich mm. and, and you know, I think the one on the right is fantastic. The fact that she's responding to the Australian bush fire, fire. so, you know, the land below, the fires above, but yeah. the ignored Indigenous knowledge is the centre line. And That's so right. they're very political, aren't they? They are. And she is very political. She's very clear about um, reclaiming lost knowledge, um, using that knowledge to help us move forward more productively, more uh, with a, and without waste. She's she's very focused on an art practice as well that doesn't have any waste associated yeah. with it. Yeah. Um, she. Because her, pigment, her pigments are all natural, aren't they? Pigments are natural, just as they are with the Nungana in, in Australia. Um, the, the designs that she uses relate to tainiko and tukutuku patterns. Um, and there's also there's a, a pattern called niho tanifa, the, the teeth of the tanifa that she's using here, this triangle form. But they also feel like, you know, little mountains. Mm. There's all sorts of references to... Um, to Māori design, yes. but she's just pushing it forward. It's, yeah. It relates yeah. to tradition, but she's she's innovating in this beautiful way. It's, it's really exciting. Could we go to the next slide now, Penny? Thank you. Great. Now, I, th I, I just love the juxtaposition between these two works. And I'd really like you to talk them through because it seems to me there's while there's a there's a real synergy with uh, Barat Jala on the left with with Nico's work you know it, even just looking at it briefly you can mm. get that sense of journeying that is so at the heart of uh, Aboriginal culture Aboriginal mm. life um, and she's using the ochres as well mm -hmm. the same material exactly the but, same material yeah <clears throat> but the bark is different isn't it this is stringy bark yeah. um and this is harvested in the winter in the or rather the wet season when the the uh the bark comes off easily and so there's only certain times of the year that they can they can get the bark um and so at other times of the year when there is no bark um Nungana will work on paper or other material but mm. yeah <clears throat> Because at the Baku Art Centre, I saw some prints that she'd done, um, but of course they'd all sold out. And of course it's closed at the moment, but I, um, you know, it's wonderful that she also, like a lot of the artists, delves into con you know, European techniques, but then turns them to her own needs and her own purpose. Yes. Am I allowed to say that my 
stand at the virtual art fair has four of Nongana's works on paper on it. Has it? Am I allowed to say that? You can say that. <laughs> you can absolutely say that. Now talk us through this fantastic photograph. I found this photograph, well I was sent this photograph by the Art Centre up in Arnhem Land and this is the, when you think of the map of Australia, the tall pointy bit on the right is Cape York and then you move up and around to the next lumpy bit up by Darwin and Arnhem Land is there. Mm -hmm. um, and this is northeast Arnhem Land where there are more lightning strikes than anywhere else in Australia. So this kind of natural phenomena is, is what Nungana is painting. And she also paints cyclones and the movement of water and the flashing of lightning against water droplets as it hits rocks. There's all sorts of... Um, it's the environment that she's painting because she is um, not allowed to paint a lot of the sacred knowledge mm. that the men hold. So she's had to invent her own um, designs, yeah. much, much the way that Nico has done. Um, and she's been incredibly successful. Like she, I don't know if um, many of you went to the MCA in Sydney for the uh, Biennale, but there were eight or ten big barks by Nongana hanging hanging there in the MCA in gorgeous pink and black colours. They were beautiful. It was a wonderful description that I read. Uh, uh, somebody, I can't remember who it was in Australia, said, when, you, when she paints, you experience sea spray crashing on rock, the dance of flames, the flicker of the snake's tongue, and lightning flashing across the sky, the elemental substances and transformative forces of their world. Mm -hmm. And that is that absolutely what you see in it. And, you know, I was, yeah, yeah. one of the things that, because everything in my head always goes back at the moment to um, modernism. And I, I just, I had to laugh really, because, you know, there in the 1920s in Paris, you had artists like Picasso and Braque and so many of them all looking at Indigenous art and mm -hmm. looking at it for impressed and wanting to learn about its, simpl its simplicity of form. Mm. And you get the same, you know, with Picasso saying he wants to paint like a child, but of course they never really could because they weren't painting from inside themselves. These artists are drawing on a deep well of history, their own passion for the land, their understanding of the materials, but they're also wanting us to share it. And I think it's the generosity of work such as this that really appealed to me. Yeah, and there's a um, one of, so I'm just looking for a piece of paper on my screen here. One of um, Nongana's um, uh, relatives up in Arnhem Land, um, his name's uh, Galaroy Unipingu. Oh, yeah. He he's a, 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 was the leader of the Northern Land Council there, and he talks about art, um, Aboriginal art, as being a political act. It's not just it's... designs. And could, well, if you bear with me, I've just got this short quote. Um, he says, when we paint, whether it's on our bodies for ceremony or on bark or canvas for the market, we're not just painting for fun or profit. We are painting as we've always done, to demonstrate our continuing link with our country, and the rights and responsibilities mm. we have to it. Furthermore, we paint to show the rest of the world that we own this country and that the land owns us. Mm. So our painting is a political act. And I, I love that quote because it talks about Indigenous art all over the world, the, the relationship mm. of, of these artists to, to their whenua. Yeah, it's the universality of it, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. 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 It, it's like the, their time has come and, you know, you're living in the time of COVID and the environment collapsing around us. It's like perhaps we can look at this kind of knowledge that they have held instinctively for tens of thousands of years. Yeah. Maybe just look at it without being patronizing about it. Maybe look at it and think, hang on, there might be something here that we mm. can, that we can use. Mm. Yes, it's that subtlety of layering, isn't it? And there's so much, the, the, with all art, the further you delve, the more you discover. Yeah. Now, Penny, I think, unless 
there's something else you want to add, Tim. I wonder whether we shouldn't open up for questions. So um, I've just sent a message to everyone saying, please let me know if they have a message. So I'm waiting. Sue Gardner, yes. So Sue, just unmute yourself and um, please go ahead and ask. Uh, hi, everyone. And thanks, Mary, and, and thanks, Tom. My, my um, question was around this idea of, I love Mary's word of being, of talking about the works being elemental. Um, and there's a really interesting connection between kind of geometric, rhythm in both of the artists' works, but also their deep connections with nature and with tradition. And um, so I suppose my question um, relates to this kind of combination between the two things. You've got one, one young artist, one old artist, both looking traditional, both aware of the contemporary. How do you see that playing out um, in, in their work in the future, Tim? Um. <laughs> Nico is um, ambitious and um, talented and has and is incredibly clever with social media. Mm. Um, and I, I wonder whether this new generation of artists are going to be making art in a whole other way. Like she has a global reach now. Um, I don't represent her. You know, I'd love to, but it's like she doesn't need me. She, you know, who wants a dirty old dealer when you can do it yourself? <laughs> <laughs> but she, she's, she is doing it on her own. Um, and people are coming to her and she has the right networks. Mm -hmm. um, Nongina is, um, it's like she's in her 80s now and just coming into her stride. I think of Sally Gabori, who had this 10-year career, mm. very short, but, but, but glorious. Uh, and Nongana's moment has, has just come. I first met her in 2015 when she won the Bark Painting Award in Darwin. Um, and that's, what, four years ago. And she's just rocketed to stardom. And in a way that Nico has in the past year, there's, mm, I don't know what it is, there's something in the air. Um, if I could make a follow-up comment, it, um, you'd mentioned about the Sydney Biennale, Tim, and I only was there very briefly before we all had to race home, but um, mm. one uh, thing that I heard in one of the artist talks was this discussion about modernism, Mary, and, um, mm. and Indigenous practice, and uh, talking about Cezanne and Picasso and their, um, and particularly Picasso's move into Cubism, thinking, and this artist was describing our thinking that um, Picasso had kind of discovered the multi-point kind of perspective of cubism, but in fact, you know, this kind of multi-viewpoint mm. uh, of perspective and deeply inbuilt in indigenous practice. Absolutely. Has mm. been going for a long time. And that's what I feel about both their works too, is that there's, both of them are depicting time or moments in time, but they have a very vertical and a very kind of rhythmic patterning to it, which is completely different to a kind of Western European sense of time. Mm. Mm. And what so many Indigenous artists are also doing is overturning this dichotomy of craft versus art, yes. you know, which, which has been a trap in a sense for a lot of Western art uh, in the la at last, um, a lot of the last century. And of course, what they're saying is, why should you have that division? You know, that it's this, and there's something incredibly appealing the organic nature of uh, the art that marries both areas. Actually, it's so funny you say that, Mary, that bringing it up as craft, because I truly had not thought of either of those artists no. as being related to craft. But, if, but, but, but in if, fact, they would be seen as that, you know, as Papa and Bark. If you look at the um, title of the, that fantastic catalogue, uh, crafting a TRI and on the front is Nico's work and and what's so stunning about it is that it's obviously a representation of her work but it's photographed so beautifully that you feel that the cover of the book is made of old tape mm, mm, it's a mm. really a beautiful beautiful mm. book that came out you know before all of this before the world collapsed around us just speaking of, of books I've got a book here that's the catalogue to go with um, Nongana's retrospective at the Art Gallery of New South Wales last year and the show was called From My Heart and My Mind mm. and that 
kind of this is the can you see that yep fantastic isn't it beautiful yeah and, and there's a she started to use uh because the art center that she comes from uh in arnhem and Bukku, they have a policy that they do not buy any materials so everything that the artwork is made of has to come from the land. So it's bark, it's ochre, and Nungana found an old toner cartridge in a kind of a landfilly kind of an area, it had magenta toner in it. So they counted that as from the land. And so <laughs> she's using recycled pink toner Brilliant. to make Brilliant. these works. I know, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have another question from Jenny Smith. Jenny, would you like to unmute and have your question there? Yes, hi. Uh, I was wondering if there were any uh, early examples of uh, Ute. Uh, obviously, there wouldn't be any uh, pre-contact, but I wondered if there was any going on post-European contact that has survived. Well, was it going on? Well, I think uh, in, it died out in the sort of 19th century. I think that it was still being made. And I, I believe there may be examples of it in the museum. Um, I think the um, OT was used sometimes for kites as well. Yes. Um, yeah, I that, read that. I read that. that yes. right? Yeah, I think that's right. But of course, in Hawaii, it didn't die out mm. in the way that it did here. Mm. Thanks. Well, I think that might be just about it. We don't have any further questions at the moment. Um, Tim, can, I, can I just say oh, something? Anna, yes. Yes, Hi, I've, Anna. Got a, I've got a collection of tapa, and um, I've got one that hangs in my stairwell that you might have seen, and it was given to a, one of the missionaries in 1840. Wow. Fantastic. And the others I've got are early ones too. So I really love them. But they tupper from here, Anna, or from so they're from they're from different Pacific Islands. Mm. Um, they come from but they're all early ones, they're not modern day. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The other the other thing that I just would I should have said too is when because uh, it just fascinates me when Nico does those incredibly fine lines she does work it out on a piece of paper first because I was watching the video but she then used like a little pointed stick and she draws them with the steadiest hand that you you've ever seen mm. whereas Nungina, you she's sitting cross-legged and using a leaf and dipping it into soot and then drawing these beautiful mm. diamond patterns on mm. a piece of bark. Mm. I mean, it's this thing of using what's there. I mean, it's a motif for our times, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and steady-handed artists. That's why they do what they do, and that's why yeah. we just tap around computers. Exactly, <laughs> wave our arms in the air. Yeah. Well, I think that seems to be about it with the questions. So um, we might just wrap that up now. Tim and Mary, it's been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for inviting us into your homes. Pleasure. And oh, your very you private for, space, me. which is a great privilege for us all. Mm -hmm. And, and um, everyone else, thank you so much for joining us. It's been wonderful. Thank you, Penny. And we look forward to more of these chats every Wednesday night. So please come and join us in the future. Thank you, everybody. Thank Good you. night. Thank, Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, Penny. Thank you.